Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on how to build a marketing plan that moves your nonprofit from good to growth with Bill McKendry. Today's webinar was made possible by our friends over at Kilter. My name is Delaney. I'm the director of partnerships here at Nonprofit Hub and Do More Good. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, we like to wait a couple minutes just to let everyone get logged in and get ready. So please introduce yourselves and let us know where you're from. Um, today, we're going to play a little game, and it's called Outside My Window. All you need to do is finish the following sentence. When I look outside my window, I see... And Bill and Rachel, you guys can play too. <laughs> oh, we have a gracious grounds from Grand Haven. Welcome, David. Hay bales. Francis, where are you seeing hay bales at? Lots of snow. Snow. Ooh, a pool. I take a pool in a garden over snow, I think. Deer tracks. Rachel, what do you see? I can see the Capitol building in Madison, Wisconsin. I've got a good view. That does sound like a good view. Bill, do you have any windows where you're at right now? Yeah, I'm actually like in this one of those Zoom rooms, you know, one of those little closets uh, that uh, soundproof, <laughs> but it actually has a big window door and I'm looking out the window to uh, the channel that goes to through Grand Haven and goes out to Lake Michigan, so. That sounds nice too. Yeah, it's actually pretty. So if I, so if I like, okay. find myself staring out there, you guys are going to have to get my attention. <laughs> so. <laughs> Very nice. I'm jealous. Okay, lots I'm of good views. I'm jealous of everyone with all their their birds and and animals and baby chicks and doggos. Yeah, the well, of, Fred has a hot Florida hat. too. 60 to 61 degrees. Oh my gosh. They're probably yes. still wearing North Face jackets though, and we're you know I would be in t-shirts, you know. But. <laughs> yep. All right. For those of you guys who are joining, um, feel free to introduce yourselves and let us know what you see outside of your window. Welcome, Hillary from Grand Rapids. Lots of snow. Me too. Um, okay. So for those of you guys just getting in, you're in the right place um, if you're here to learn how to build a marketing plan of Bill McKendry. Before we jump into today's content, we're just going to take a minute and go over a few housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded and you'll hear from us later today with the full recording for future reference, along with any other resources that Bill might mention. You're encouraged to engage with us throughout the session by using the chat and answering the poll question. If you attend live for today's webinar, which you are, use the chat and answer the polls. You'll be in the running to get a free copy of do more good the book um and that's a signed copy by bill bill i know i saw some big news about your book on linkedin can you tell us what's going on on amazon this is the book you know it's about like a week and a half ago and uh, um it's it it got to number one in nonprofit uh, category of new releases i had a matt damon's book on on uh, water issues around the world so you know, next time I see Matt, whenever I, I do, I'll make sure I'll let him know that, you know, we, we were ahead of, <laughs> on the rank. Yes, <laughs> you got to do that. Yeah, but pretty cool. Very cool. So again, guys, if you stay engaged with us today, you can get your very own signed copy of Do More Good, the book. Um, and if you don't win today, you can still get a copy of it, um, either with a purchase of a Cause Camp ticket or a Cause Network membership. Or you can just head over to our website and purchase your own copy. And we'll remind you about all of those options in the follow-up email this afternoon. Um, questions are welcomed. There'll be live Q&A at the end of the webinar. And our team is keeping track of all of your questions um, that you guys have during the session. So don't be shy. And we'll do our very best to answer all of them. Quick shout out to our platform partner, Firespring. Firespring works every day to create tools and resources that make fundraising easier and more effective. From mission-driven websites to engaging marketing programs that work, they have tools you need to highlight your nonprofit and make you shine as a leader. Today's webinar was made possible by Kilter, and today we're grateful to have Rachel with us. Kilter is the most inclusive activity-based engagement platform for good. They help you curate exciting events that foster community through activities that your supporters are doing already in their daily lives. Kilter makes it possible for anyone, anywhere, and of any ability level to support your cause. 
and you can include Kilter on your fundraising journey. Rachel, do you want to share a little bit more about that? I would love to. Thanks for having me today. And it's lovely to meet all of you guys that are talking in the chat. I'm happy to be here uh, and tell you a little bit more about Kilter. I'll keep it really quick today. Um, Delaney gave a great overview of what we do. We work with nonprofits of all sizes across the country. We're talking teeny tiny family foundations up to large national organizations to customize your engagement events. Now that could be a steps campaign or a meditation based campaign, a reading campaign, a volunteering advocacy campaign. It's totally customizable to what you guys and how you guys would like to engage your supporters. Now, once a year, we host an event called Miles for Meaning. And Delaney, if I could share my screen real quick. Um, yeah, go for it. I'm also going to drop a form here in the, uh, in the chat now. But you'll be done finishing the form by the time I'm even completed speaking. But once a year, we host an a, um, an event called Miles for Meaning. It's open to any 501c3 across the country to join. Now, it is a distance-based event meaning that we are going to have all of your supporters join the event on your team and they're going to track one of their, uh, or, sorry, they're going to connect one of their devices. So that could be Apple Health, Google Fit, Fitbit, Garmin, Strava. They're going to track all of those miles across the month of March. So it's coming up quick, but you guys still have time to come and join the event. If you fill out that form, we're going to be giving away one free entry into Miles for Meaning. And for every other attendee that is interested in joining, you'll have half off entry. Now, we are going to make it super easy. We can, we create all of your messaging materials, your social media materials to get those people onto your team. The best part, we have $60,000 in donation prizes to give away to our uh, competing organizations. Now, the grand prize, the team that logs the most miles by stepping, walking, hiking, running, or biking, or rolling in a wheelchair, you're going to get a $30,000 grand prize. And then we have another $30,000 to give away to the top 25 teams and some additional fun social engagement campaigns. And there's another upside, all of our fundraising technology will be turned on. That means your participants can donate directly to your organization throughout the course of the event, or they can use our peer-to-peer -peer functions, which are text to donate, email to donate, or socially integrated. 100% of the donations made throughout the month of March are going directly back to those charity partners. It's how we work with our partners across the year. It's our 100% to charity guarantee. So if you guys would like to learn a little bit more about the event, please feel free and fill out that form. We'll let you know the winner tomorrow morning. Uh, everyone else, half off entry. And if you'd like to learn about our other customizable solutions, you can reach out to me directly. I know Delaney is going to be um, including my email address in the uh, in the follow up. So really looking forward to getting to know you and your community and, and your supporters. Thanks for having me, Delaney. Yeah, and Rachel, I mean, that's a huge prize and they can enter for free to win that prize if they complete your form and everyone else can get half off too. So don't miss out on that, guys. Um, next, I'd love to introduce the teacher of today's session. Um, we're all here to um, to listen to the marketing expert on nonprofit causes, Bill McKendry. Bill is the founder and chairman of Do More Good and is also the founder and chief creative officer of Haven, a creative hub. Bill was recognized in 1999 when he headed Hannon McKendry as the top professional nationally doing cause marketing work by the American Advertising Federation and was inducted into the Federation's Hall of Achievement. Bill has cultivated a reputation as an expert in key success principles for nonprofit marketing and communications. And Bill, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Awesome. I am not seeing the presentation, though. I... Oh, here we go. I can get it up. <laughs> Good to be with you, everybody, and uh, and thanks for spending some time with me today. And uh, I, I got some pretty cool content today, based on some recent information that I've discovered uh, about uh, how to put together a marketing plan. Uh, and you would think, man, how to really? I just recently discovered some information on how to put together a marketing plan, but I have, and so I'm, I'm eager to share this with you. But it basically, today's uh, presentation is really just some basic fundamental things. Uh, and some stretch ideas uh, on how to build a marketing plan to go from good to growth. And so 
the thing that I just found out actually was uh, they're doing some research on the nonprofit and charity category with, on Amazon.com uh, because of, of a recent release that I did. Mine is, right now is, ha, has been the number one new release, but the number one book overall uh, in this category is surprisingly a business book. And, uh, and, and it's written in very business-like language. And I actually have a copy of it right here. Uh, here we go. <laughs> and uh, it's the, it's the one-page marketing plan. And uh, it has been top of the charts for quite a while. And, uh, and so I was intrigued. You know, a one-page marketing plan, that seems to be a pretty smart idea. And, and it is smart. It's actually filled with a lot of good content. I'm very, again, I'm very surprised how much of the language is so business oriented. Uh, and so you really have to kind of go through some hoops to kind of transfer that knowledge to the nonprofit world, which uh, part of that's what I'm going to do today. However, the book has a very unique structure and it has basically nine steps to building a one page marketing plan. And as I went through the content of this book, you know, I, it, it is so basic that I, I felt like you know, maybe it'd be smart to, you know, use this structure, but then talk about how I would add on to this and add some additional insights that would allow you when you look at something like this, this one page marketing plan, you would be able to use the basic structures of this, however, have some additional insights and knowledge in order to uh, build a stronger plan uh, than maybe uh, the author is offering here. So, uh, What's really interesting is, uh, so you look at the top section and, and, and when we go back to this, you see this one page uh, plan has three basic sections, a red section, a yellow section and a green section. And uh, what's going on here is they have kind of like the pre-planning stage, which is in red. And uh, it talks about, you know, my, who's my target audience and what's my message to my target audience and, you know, what media do I want to use? And, uh, and so that's the structure, you know, of the top part of this. And then, and it's in red because they say it's the before part, right? And so then there's the during part of the marketing plan, uh, which is how, how do I capture leads? Uh, how, uh, you know, what's my nurturing system? And, uh, and then also what kind of, what's my ongoing kind of conversation strategy uh, to kind of keep the conversation going along? Right. And so that's this is the during the campaign phase. And so, you know, very simple uh, box structure. And then the last one is kind of the after, which is, you know, I've, I've done this campaign and, uh, and I put together this plan. And what are some of the things that I have to make sure that I do once I get things implemented? Right. You know, and it's, and it's talking about creates experiences. It, you know, it talks about, uh, you know, increasing the customer lifetime value. Uh, and then also, how do you orchestrate? And, and, and stimulate referrals. And again, I think the structure is actually, you know, pretty nice. And, uh, and, and I was surprised how simple and smart it is. Obviously, it's not a robust plan. There's a lot of other things that, that you, you could do. But I thought maybe kind of walking through the structure of this book, since it's so highly rated on Amazon in our own category, but then now adding some additional insights to that. You know, as I said, we're number one in Amazon in, in the new release section. So I wanted to kind of like compare and contrast the advice that this author is giving in the one page marketing plan and then what I would add to that. So the first one, if you remember, was all about, you know, targeting, you know, who's your target? Uh, and I would I would add that, you know, better yet. Right. You know, so maybe targeting is a little too simplistic and it doesn't give you enough information to really think through who your target audience is because you may actually have a lot of different targets you may have you know staff volunteers donors uh, other other supporters the community at large the people or things that you serve and, and uh, all kinds of audiences and so just to have a box that says you know who's your target may not allow you to really kind of think through well enough what you know how should you think about your target audience? And I would suggest that you use the STP process, which, which I outline in the book, but I've, I've, I've talked a lot about, which is about segmenting, targeting, and positioning, you know, with, with the, against those target audiences, right? So not only do you need to think of all your different targets, but you need to segment them on, you know, are they priority or are they secondary? Are they, you know, are they, are they big? Are they small? 
who do you want to go after and what's really, you know, an important part of your success and who are some of the other, or, you know, audiences that are important, but not quite crucial to your success. What do they look like? What are their ages? What are their incomes? Where do they live? Uh, you know, what do they like to do? There's all kinds of different ways to segment your audience. And that by segmenting your audiences, not only are you going to target them, you're going to be thinking about them in terms of, you know, their, their lifestyles or their values. And as a result, you're going to be far more effective in targeting them. And positioning is also something that you have to be thinking about. It's like each one of those audiences, how do you position your organization to, to, uh, to achieve the greatest success with them possible? You know, and positioning, quite honestly, is a lot about differentiation. And, uh, and how do you differentiate from a lot of other alternatives? The, one of the key uh, principles that I teach you know, in terms of competition and looking at the market and when you start thinking about segmenting and targeting and positioning you have to realize and i say this often and, and that is your competition as a nonprofit organization and your biggest competitor in the for in the not as a nonprofit organization may surprise you and you may not even think of them as your competition and so i would and what what is that you're asking well bill what is our competition that we, and we don't see and we may be surprised about well, when you think about what you really need to be successful as a nonprofit organization, you need people's discretionary time and you need their discretionary money, right? Preferably both. So if you really think about who's competing with you on discretionary time and money, it is not another nonprofit organization. I'll guarantee you. Who is your competition? It's Nike. It's Coca-Cola. It's McDonald's. It's Apple. Those people are competing for discretionary dollars and discretionary time as well. And as a result, being super smart about the plans that you put together, not just saying, oh, here's our target audience, but thinking about the, those audiences and their values and their unique properties and, and their unique situations, prioritizing them and thinking about how you're going to position what you offer and provide as something different than any other competitor is offering. So why should they give you more of their discretionary time and money than someplace else? That's the seriousness that you have to take when it comes to targeting. And so a lot of people talk about, you know, well, how do, how do I best, you know, message? And I would say how you best message is always be positioning when you're messaging, right? You saw the structure that this book was, that this book was built on, that nine box structure. Um, my, my, my whole idea and my structure is about ideas. It's about having insights. It's about developing direction. It's about exploring different ways to express yourself, right? It's about putting together an action plan and then also knowing how to measure success so that when you go through the whole process you, and you determine up front what success looks like so that when you get to the end, you understand that, you know, whether you achieve success or not, and it's a constantly move process you have to go right back to the beginning once you measure success are there some insights that you can use to make everything better so use those insights develop new direction develop new expression and so on right but so positioning is key and so just throwing messages out to the marketplace and information out to the marketplace doesn't work anymore this world is way too busy for that you have to constantly be putting your your messages through the filter of, are, are we communicating why we're unique are we communicating why we're worthy of support? Are we communicating really well why we're a better alternative for people's time and money than something else, right? And I talk about a very simple way to think about how to position your organization, and that is to own an EST. And a lot of people think that's an acronym. It's actually not an acronym. It's, a, it's any word that ends in EST. And so I, want, I would really want you to think about your positioning versus not just general messaging as a whole, but saying my messaging has to be all about positioning our organization all the time. We always have to be putting it through that filter. But and I'm going to challenge you and say that you can only own one word that's an EST. You know, major retailers and major organizations are forced to do this. And as a result, their communications is very, very clear and concise. You know, like Walmart, for example, their EST is lowest. They're the lowest price uh, competitor 
in their category. And as a result, everything goes through the lowest price filter at Walmart when they're messaging, right? Target, they're big, one of their biggest competitors, has a different ESD. They're the coolest in their category, right? And so as a result, each one of them puts all their branding and all their messaging through this filter of owning an EST. And so it's really important that you do that too. And I, I hear all the time from nonprofit organizations, you know, it's like, I can't do that. That's really hard to get it down to an EST, something simple, right? You know, but I just, I just shared with you Target and Walmart, they're able to get it down to a one word EST that they're gonna own and they're gonna put all their messaging through that filter, right? In the end, you see the big brands, how simple they make it. And I challenge nonprofit organizations all the time. It's like, you know, do you think that your organization is more sophisticated, more complex than something like Apple, something like Nike, something like Harley Davidson, for example? And, you know, when I challenge nonprofit organizations to realize that their organization is nowhere as complex as those kinds of organizations, yet those kinds of organizations are so smart about positioning that in the end, their messaging is very crisp and clear. Matter of fact, Nike got it down to three words, Apple got it down to two words, and Harley Davidson got it down to one word, right? So all their messaging in the end revolves around just do it, think different, and for Harley Davidson, the word freedom. So if you don't think you can do this, I'm gonna challenge you really hard and say, some of the most complex organizations in the entire world can do this. I know you can do it. You just have to really think about it. And then you have to own something and then you have to message it really well all the time so that you are always thinking about every message that goes out is about positioning us and differentiating us. And let's make, let's be clear in that, uh, in that direction. You know, this uh, one page marketing plan talked about, you know, think about the media, media that you want to be in. And I would say, you know, that's a business book again, right? And so they automatically jump to advertising and marketing, which I encourage, believe me, I think more nonprofit organizations should jump to advertising and marketing, but it's also very tough to get boards and, and, and donors to contribute to that. Uh, I, have, I have ways in my book to help you with that, but I also don't want you to forget that the number one media channels uh, right now uh, in the country are social media channels. And so instead of just doing media, make sure you're at least, you, are, you be media, right? And what do I mean by that? You gotta think of yourself as an organization, as, a, as your own media channel, as you're putting out content in the marketplace, I want you to take your content as seriously as ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and any other media channel that you think about. I mean, they put together programming. They create very unique personalities. They give people a lot of great information. They draw a crowd because their content is so rich. That's what you need to do as well, right? And so a tip on that really is, you know, I would encourage you to be media and make sure that you be the cause thought leader in your category. If you're a rescue mission, you should be the thought leader, at least in your area. On on any content related to homelessness, you know, if you're about helping animals, or if you're if you're helping cancer survivors, all your content needs to be about being a thought leader in that category. And then how you build your content really are around three words. You always got to be thinking about quality, quantity, and variety, right? So you need to get a lot of content out, but it's got to be high quality content. So don't just throw things out willy nilly. I mean, you really got to say to yourself, if we're going to put something out, and I know Bill said, man, frequency wins, we got to get a lot of quantity out of content, but it's got to be quality content. Otherwise, it reflects poorly on you and your thought leadership. And also make sure you have a lot of variety, you bring in a lot of different voices, a lot of different perspectives, and make sure that you <clears throat> that you can um, keep it fresh and not keep banging the same drum all the time, right? And so you have to challenge yourself that quality, quantity to variety line actually came from Forbes magazine and Forbes magazine, you know, during the switch over from, you know, being a print publication to being primarily a digital publication. Most publications did not, especially early on, did not make that transition. Well, Forbes magazine was like the star, you know, I think Forbes magazine and the New York times were the two print publications that made the transition extremely well into the digital world. 
And Forbes said it came down to these three things that if they just thought about their content of making sure it was quality content, making sure it was quantity, that they were putting out a lot of content as much as they could. Uh, but then it also provided a variety of storytelling and a variety of perspectives. That's what draws people in to your perspective. And you can't be afraid either. Like, you know, if you see something that's really catching fire on your social media, put a few advertising dollars behind it, give it a boost. You'd be surprised how much $100 could do over a week period of time of just boosting on Facebook and Instagram. It's amazing. You know, I've helped with some really small nonprofit organizations and attracted 10,000 views on a $100 uh, spend over a few day period uh, just by boosting a post that we could see was trending and was catchy and that we all needed was more exposure to more people to really kind of take off, right? And so why I say be a media versus do a media is, you know, the, the whole concept of, 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 you know, PR and earned media and stuff like that. Not that I'm, I'm, I'm discounting that. Believe me, man, if you, if you do earned media right, it can really, it can really help you. However, you got to control the controllables and say to yourself, our a media channel, control those controllables. Make sure you're doing the best of your own social media. And guess what? If you are, the media, the big media, well, first thing they'll do when you send them any kind of press release or any kind of notification is they'll come to your social media and try to understand what it is that you're bringing to the market and what you're saying to the market. And they could, they'll build stories off of stories that you've already created. So it's really important that you control the controllables and be media. Don't just do media. Book. You know, the one page marketing plan also talks about make sure you capture leads. And again, this is this is very business thinking, right? And e I would even tell a business person this same advice. It's like, yeah, you want to capture leads. But at the same time, make sure that you captivate audiences as much as you capture them, right? I mean, who wants to be captured, right? Everybody wants to be captivated. And so how do you captivate them? Well, number one, be consistent, be out there, right? And, uh, and make sure that you know, you're using that quantity, quality, variety thinking and just get out there and be consistent and be consistently good, right? And as a result, you'll learn, people will learn to love you. They'll love your content, they'll love your thinking and they wanna, they wanna be engaged. But the most important aspect of being captivating is not being organizational centric. It's about being audience centric. And so you need to put yourself in the shoes of your audience and ask yourself, you know, would I be interested in reading this if I didn't know anything about my organization, right? So that's the first filter to be audience centric is saying, you know, would I want to read this? Why would I want to read this? If I didn't care about this organization or know about this organization, what would cause me to want to read or view this content that's going out into the marketplace, right? So be captivating. But the other thing too is, you know, so you don't want to be thinking about what you want to say. You want to think about what they want to hear. But beyond that, you know, talk about people outside of your organization. Talk about your donors. Talk about your volunteers. Talk about your staff. Talk about the people and the communities that are helped as a result of your work. You know, you'd be surprised that you start talking about your donors. You start talking about your staff and volunteers on social media suddenly you take advantage of their entire sphere of influence and that's the kind of stuff that really spreads so become audience centric versus you know being um you know internally focused all the time that's how you will capture more because you'll captivate more right the next thing i would suggest too is you know it talks about nurturing leads uh in this book and again that's you know yeah, there's all kinds of other words for this drip, uh, you know, leads and, you know, managing the whole drip process and stuff like that. Sounds really scientific to me, you know? And so nurturing sounds fine, but better yet, why not treat your donors like neighbors? And this is a concept that I've talked about before, but it actually came to me and, and, and I learned about it through a guy named Ken Caldwell, who's uh, the chief marketing officer of Compassion International right now. And Ken has a huge background in, in marketing, you know, where he was the chief marketing officer of Domino's Pizza, Wendy's, Taco Bell. He was a CEO of Papa Murphy's Pizza. And then he left it all behind and went to work for Compassion International. 
And uh, one of the things that he realized in at, at working in, at uh, Compassion International is, you know, in order to be in, in the consumer world, in order in order to drive everything, you know, you just have to be customer centric because if you're customer centric, everybody's going to be happy because the customer is going to be happy. You know, the franchisees are going to be happy. The uh, the stockholders are going to be happy. The board is going to be happy because you're creating happiness with the customer. And he really started thinking about, you know, how do you nurture relationships with so many different audiences, right? And so the different audiences, when you think about about them, you know, you have you have a donor audience, right? You have a, a volunteer audience. Uh, you have a staff audience. You have you know a community audience. You have the people or things and animals or whatever it is audience that you help, right? And so there's all kinds of different audiences. And Ken said, man, that was really hard because he didn't have that central customer to be focused on. Uh, and, and as a result, he felt like he needed to create a new idea to be innovative. And at National Arsenal, they decided to become neighbor-centric. And the, and the number one thing that, he, you know, kind of overall is, you know, the kind of big takeaway is you know, just make sure that you create, you treat your targets as you would want to be treated, right? We kind of talked about that in the last section where it's like, create content that you would want to read if you didn't know anything about this organization, but make sure that you treat donors and staff members and anybody that you con come in contact as if they were your neighbor. What's interesting about this concept too is, you know, at any point when you think about your neighbors or your neighborhood, there's going to be some neighbors who have resources to give, right? There are neighbors that have uh, um, that have uh, 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 time to give, right? But then there are neighbors who are, who are in need, right? But it doesn't matter if they're all your neighbors; they're all your neighbors. And at any point, they could actually switch places. So you have to make sure that you know maybe someday, someday the guy that's or the person that's doing really well uh, financially, uh, they might lose everything, and they're going to be a person in need. And so you always have to be prepared to be able to respond to their current situation, but you still treat them all like they're all neighbors, whether they have something to give, whether they have something to share, or whether they need care, right? So one really practical thing that Ken and his team did with this kind of thinking was when COVID happened and uh, they go, uh oh, you know, uh, giving's probably gonna go down. And uh, what are we gonna do about this? And so they went right back and said, let's put this into the neighbor filter how would we treat our donors as neighbors? So they decided that what they were gonna do is they were gonna call all their donors. They were divided up names among all their staff members and they said, let's just reach out and let's call all our donors. Let's ask them how they're doing. Are they, are they concerned at all you know, about COVID and are they healthy? And then, but they didn't stop there. In order to treat everybody like a neighbor, they also made an offer to their neighbors, to all their donors. And they asked all their donors, they said, we just want you to know that Compassion International, we know this is probably gonna be a tough time, that donations are probably gonna go down uh, because of COVID. And, and as a result, we just wanted to reach out to every one of our donors and just say, if, you're, if there's any concern on your part, if you have a financial concern or, or, or a health concern or something like that, where you need to suspend your donations for a while, we wanna let you know that you should do that. And we just want to you know that we're prepared because you know, we've been a smart organization and we have a rainy day fund. We're gonna be able to sustain a very long period of time because you know, we, we've been smart about our investments and haven't just given away all of our money. Uh, and so we have, we have a fund any day that's going to sustain us through COVID. So if you need to not uh, to suspend your giving or even stop your giving, we, we just wanted to let you know we're okay with that. And we wanted to give you our, we want you to know that we're prepared for that. So then I asked Ken, I said, well, how did that go? And they said, well, it was great. We had so many great conversations with our donors because we treated them like neighbors and they really shared some really you know, great things with us and some heartbreaking stories. And, you know, it's just really good to get to know everybody on our list in, in, a in a very personal manner, like they were our neighbors. What happened over the long haul? Donations went up. Matter of fact, they raised more money than they ever raised before. Why? Because they treated their donors like they would want to be treated, right? 
donors are people too. They're not ATMs, right? And so you have to make sure to not treat them as such. Another aspect is, you know, they, in this in this plan, they talk about converting leads, you know, and again, this is very, very business language, right? And I would suggest, yeah, I agree. Let's convert leads. How do you, how do we, how do we convert leads, you know, into, uh, you know, becoming ongoing support and donors and, uh, and being connected over to our organization over a long haul while well, we create meaningful connections. We don't just, these aren't transactional statements, right? We can't just treat donors like we're in this transaction. And, and as a result, we need to create meaningful connections so that they do want to stay with us, right? So it isn't just about converting, it's about also connecting. How do you do that? Well, I talk about, you know, kind of like this access of, you know, our, do we have a strong connection or are we just a commodity? Are we unimportant to people or are we important to people? And obviously where you want to be on this chart is that far right, that top right corner. And actually you want to be as close to, this, to, the, to the very corner of that as you possibly can. You want to be extremely important and you want to have extremely strong connections uh, with your donors. And the way to do that though is always be moving from what you do or offer to what you mean. And so when you think about communicating with your donors, I talked about positioning, right? And one really great way to position is to always make sure that you communicate what you mean to the community that you're helping, what you mean to the to the people or things or animals or whatever that you're helping that, you know, you what what difference does your organization make to the cause that you're trying to help? And so, again, that's part of positioning. That's about differentiation. And if it's centered in meaning and purpose and making meaningful differences, you are going to make meaningful connections, which will convert one time donors or somebody else convince them to become a donor to, to be want to be connected to your organization because you're making such a huge difference and they want to do more good. And as a result, they're hooking their train to you because you help them fill that void in their life or fill that purpose in their life of wanting to do more good. And so they get behind you because they have a connection, not because you converted them in some way. This book also talks about creating experiences and, and, and I, I'm 100% behind that. And I, I think that's fantastic that they put it in their, in their program. But I would tell you that you don't just wanna create an experience, you wanna have a, a way that you think about creating experiences. And this is actually a pretty well-known uh, strategy, especially for brand experience people and hospitality people uh, and people who put on conventions and things like that. There's actually this thing about experiences. There's five E's and it's about creating excitement before they even you know, have the experience, creating excitement when they enter the experience, right? Create just engagement you know, with them when you're with them, right? Be extremely engaging and think, you know, what's it gonna be like when, when I meet with this person or they come to visit us or they travel with us to go see something. Think about that very intentionally about how you will be engaging with them, right? And then also think about, okay, we thought about the entry. How do we make the entry super exciting for them into that experience? Let's make the exit just as exciting, right? You know, I don't know. Is it a gift? Is it, you know, uh, a strong statement? Is it, you know, whatever it is, you have to create an exit uh, from that experience that is memorable. And then you need to follow up. You need to extend that. And you got to keep being, you know, whether it's send pictures to them uh, of, of their experience, whether it's, you know, send them a gift from, that experience or send them a note from that experience, you know, an unexpected note, handwritten, uh, whatever it is, don't just think about, well, we got to create an experience. No, you got to create five experiences. Excitement before, excitement is, or you know, fantastic entry into that experience, an engaging experience, and an exit from that experience that, is, that really makes it memorable. And you keep in contact and extend that experience uh, with them. This book also talks about building lifetime value. I, you know, I hear that all the time, you know, especially, you know, a long time ago when I worked with a lot of direct marketers, uh, because I'm more of a top of a funnel awareness type of guy, right? You know, so 
partnered with a lot of direct marketers and direct mail guys and you know all these people always talk about well we're building lifetime value you know so you you know that first mailer may not give us the return on investment that we were expecting but you know we keep doing it and we're going to build lifetime value with that with that uh, person who donates just one time and we're going to really work to build that lifetime value and i would say that's great but make sure you make that donors feel valued so it isn't just about you getting out, out of it what you want it's about them getting out of it what they want right and so i, I mentioned this earlier do not treat donors like atms i'm not the first person to say that right you know that right you've heard it from a lot of other people but sometimes it gets tough you forget man it's if you get desperate and you know and you're and you're nervous in front of a big donor or whatever it's, it's tough not to feel make them feel like atms just make sure you don't they don't feel that way so you got to make sure that they feel valued not that you're just looking for a value from them right and three things that i will guarantee you of how they feel value is basically speak louder than words right so what will they see what will you say and what will you do those actions are going to speak volumes about your organization and how much you value them right and so it's really important that you think through those things how you act will demonstrate how much you value them this book also talks about uh, the one page marketing plan talks about orchestrating referrals and, uh, and I think that's kind of a cool idea of thinking, how am I going to orchestrate uh, getting referrals from the people who have given? Uh, and I would tell you, that's great. But I would say you have to inspire introductions, right? People who are inspired by your mission, who are inspired by your vision, inspired by your work, because of all the other things that I, I talked about uh, prior to this, will be inspired to introduce you to their network because you know what they're going to be so proud of the work that you're doing and so proud to be affiliated with you that you'll be they'll be inspired to introduce you and some tips on how to inspire them i just go through you know first thing i would tell you is nothing motivates like success so you always have to make sure in all of your communications even sometimes when it's tough like when donations are not pouring in or there's economic tough times or you know we have challenges like a pandemic like what like what we've been through right it's always important to say say to yourself i just got to gather myself i can't sound desperate right i have to make sure that i sound like the work that we're doing not only is important but it's making a difference right and so i would always tell you to filter a lot of your communications also through the idea of saying to yourself how can i motivate through success and these are just some some words that i put together in terms of you know what are the motivational ideas that people see as success like the impact made the change created the life altering things that are done uh, through your organization the people the things the animals that are saved the minds the hearts that are reached the transformational outcomes the comfort care and peace that's provided the growth and achievement that has been made possible through your organization and through your efforts. New alternatives brought to light that didn't exist before. So you're, you're innovating also when you're out there in the marketplace, right? Enlightenment that is occurring and horizons that are expanding. Notice I didn't, none of these really say big numbers, you know, and big results. A lot of these can be a lot of little stories about the impact that, that, that people are making uh, and you're making with their partnership in the market and the differences that you're making together so make sure you always bring them back into the equation saying we are successful because you're helping us to be successful as a result you'll inspire them to introduce you to other people because they're going to be so proud to be affiliated with you and so proud of the success and difference that you're making that they want their friends actually to quite know that they're involved with a very successful nonprofit organization that's making a significant difference in the things that they really care about. And so inspire 
don't orchestrate. So that's uh, actually the end of that. Uh, hopefully that was helpful for you in terms of, you know, using some other content and, uh, and the simplicity. I mean, I do, you know, I do congratulate this one page marketing plan, number one, for being number one in our category. But, and, and it's, again, it's so written to business people that I'm very surprised uh, that it's as successful in our category as it is. But I think the structure they have is very good. And hopefully the things that I've just added to it adds more fuel to those boxes uh, that makes you even more successful in filling out uh, that one page marketing plan. Yeah, it is an excellent book. And Bill, I kind of agree. You had so many cool creative prompts throughout your presentation. Um, we did just throw your slides into the handout section for anyone who wants to have those immediately, but we'll also include those in the follow-up email. Um, one thing that stuck out to me, Bill, that I'm probably going to think about for a little while is um, instead of what you do or offer, what do you mean to people that you work with? And that's something that's going to probably be on my mind for a little bit. Um, yeah, what you offer and provide is, is so self-centered, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. But when you move it to, but this is what we mean to the marketplace. You know, when mm -hmm. Simon Sinek and his famous, you know, uh, start with why, right? What it really means is what meaningful work are you doing? What impact are you doing? Start there. And then people ask questions about, you know, oh, what do you do? How do you do it? What's the process, right? You know, that that conversation will be free flowing once you've got them engaged and captivated, right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, so much more important what you mean versus what you do. Um, so we'll start with the questions that we have, but again, if you guys have anything else that comes up on your mind, any questions that you have about your marketing plan, now is the time. Um, Robin said, is there a rule of thumb on the quantity of social media posts per day of the week, specifically Facebook and LinkedIn? I, I would just tell you, no, there isn't. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I'm amazed how many emails I get from brands that I love. Right. You know, and, uh, and, and they send me like an email a day or sometimes two. Uh, and I'm not annoyed by them because I like their brands. You know, I, you know, I, I don't mind hearing from them and I can choose to ignore it if I don't have the time. Right. You know, so, um, but I will tell you though, you have to, you do have to be careful. Like if you, if you put out too many, like you may actually put out something, I would encourage you to kind of wait and see if it, if it's starting to build some traction and, and if it, you know, give it a day, give it a two days, maybe give it three days, you know, see if it's building some traction before you start putting out another post. And the strategy behind that is, you know, where I believe frequency wins and I, and you, you could do a post every day, as long as all of them are catching wind. But if they're, I would encourage you to be mindful of how many you put out because every time you put out a post, it lowers the ranking of your past post. And so, you know, Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and all the social media content, they love fresh content. So they're glad to kind of rise fresh content and push old con content away. But if you let it sit out there for a while, it still seems fresh after two or three days. So. I, I have noticed that in the work that we're doing that, you, you know, while I'm real eager to just like constantly putting out information, you do have to give some posts some time. I had, I had a post recently where uh, I decided, I, just, you know, I think it's a really strong post. And I think some people will really be engaged by this post if I just let it sit. So I decided rather mm -hmm. than other things I could say for the next few days, I, I decided to let it sit for like four or five days. And you know, the first day I was kind of disappointed. I thought, man, that's a really good post, and but it only has like 200, you know, interactions with it. You know, I go, I just think that one's really good. I'm gonna let it sit for four or five days. I'm not gonna be tempted to put out new content. And sure enough, within four or five days, it was at like 5,000 people were engaged in it because I didn't layer other content on top of it and push it aside. That's excellent advice. Um, Daniel said, do you have any ideas or tips for creating high quality content on a low budget with little time? I think probably a common <laughs> Yeah, well, you wanna, I, buy, buy an iPhone 13, you know, if you can, because that camera on that thing is just wicked. I mean, it is just like, you know, you know I mean, they're literally Hollywood movie makers are throwing away all their camera equipment and starting to film movies on these iPhone 13s, right? So they are and, so and, good. And, and it has a setting which is really interesting there's a setting on on the new iphone 13 that's called cinematic 
and it just in cinematic style it, you know basically wherever you point the camera and what you're focusing on it really focuses on that and everything kind of goes soft around it and i'm just telling you everything looks more beautiful you know even me i look way better in cinematic <laughs> than i do in this zoom room right and, and it's like you know so it's like you know little things that you can do to heighten the quality right and you know be and i would just tell you be smart you know choose your words really carefully try to make every word impactful keep things short you know ask questions right polls and stuff like that which can be created on social media very easily asking people what they think that's those are great ways to to engage people and highlight people talk about people talk about staff talk about volunteers talk about donors talk about the impact on people on the market that, that you're making right those are the kind of things that create interaction and it doesn't take any more than just a really good iphone and some really good thinking right Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I think my, I, my son just got an iPhone 13 and it was, it was, uh, it was uh, $25 a month, you know, <laughs> payment plan. So if you can't afford $25 a month, then we got, we got other things to talk about, but you know, really just those two things, just really, really thinking about your words and really, really thinking about your visuals. 80% mm -hmm. of the reason why people will stop will be your visuals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Tim um, had a question earlier on in your presentation um, about the EST word. Um, and he said, when you are trying to move people to a cause by engaging emotion, how are you able to find an EST word? What, what's the cause again? Is it on, on emotion or was that the question? Or He said, when you're trying to move people to a cause by engaging emotion, how do you use an EST word? Yeah, there, there's always an EST word that you can find, but it, it is, but it's about what you deliver. Like we worked with an organization that provides all kinds of content on education around the world, right? And uh, and they and they struggled like crazy with, with EST. It's like we provide content, you know, it's about education and stuff like that. And so, but when we dug, dug into what they were about, we just said in your category, what ES? You don't have to own the EST of anything in the world, right? But in your category. You know how do you communicate this and they're and they're reaching third world countries and this is super emotional territory right uh, but they they communicate their emotions through their words and their through their pictures but their but their position needs to be dead serious business like right and so even though you're saying that you know ah you know we're emotional and we want to be emotional in our communications your strategy needs to be dead serious business right i mean listen to target coolest right but back to this education client who's reaching, you know, third world uh, uh, people on education. When we finally got it down to why they're so successful, it's because their content and their education materials are the simplest to use and understand. EST, simplest. And so the word simplest is not in itself inherently emotional and beautiful, but it is a strong position that differentiates them. And so now it's just about telling stories about these people engaging with their content and it made sense to them and their education levels increased so much because they're really strong at making things simple and understandable for people to move forward. So I would tell you that your EST doesn't have to be emotional. Matter of fact, it probably won't be emotional. It will be very businesslike and, mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it will be like, once my competitor understands I'm drawing this line and I'm going to be the coolest or I'm going to be the lowest or I'm going to be the simplest. They should be quaking in their boots because they know we're right. We're that good at what we do. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, Stephanie has a question um, specific to something that they're doing in their marketing right now. Um, tips for marketing their free programs to families served. Um, she said, so when thinking free versus paid, are there any differences or things to think about? So what are they doing again? They're, they're offering they're marketing that. free programs to the families that they serve. And she's caught between free and just, are there any differences in general for marketing free versus paid programming? Oh, free is easier. You know, that should be really, like really easy, <laughs> you know, but I, you know, um, so you're marketing free, but I think, you know, somehow somebody created a situation where it is free right so you know somebody's providing some level of support so you can't forget to kind of go back and 
thank the people that have made that available, but also, you know, it, by explaining that to the people who are receiving it as well, it's like, we're not giving it to you for free because it has no value, right? That's the problem with free is people think, well, it's free. And then, so, you know, it can't be that good. It's free, right? And so free is actually, while it's, I, I joked and said it's super easy, it also can be super hard because people don't perceive it as valuable. How you, how you make people realize that it's valuable is go back to how it became free. You know, a group of donors or a group of organizations came together, cared so much about this cause or this issue that they have spent the money and big money and raised the support so that you can get it for free. This would normally be, if you had to pay for this on your own, it'd be out of your, out of range for you but realize that there are so many people who care about you receiving this that they're footing the bill for you so that you get it for free so suddenly now you hear okay this is not cheap free stuff that you're just giving away this isn't bad stuff this is actually stuff that people really cared about they raised money for it they got behind it there are heroes that we need to highlight as a result and as a result i'm able to get it for, for free where i normally would not be able to get such great quality stuff for free, but it's only through the help of these people. Mm -hmm. So you just got to change the, change the storytelling on that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, Bill, Liz wants to know if you have any tips for sharing stories of folks that they serve without it feeling exploitive, um, wanting to honor their journeys while sharing their work in a respectful way. Yeah. And I would just say, tell the story in a very respectful way, you know, focus the, on them personally, why they needed this help, you know, or, or why they wanted to give that help. I mean, yeah, you have to be really careful about, you know, especially the, you know, the receiver audience of, of your, of, of your work. Right. And same thing with even the donor audience, you know, anytime you're highlighting anybody, just again, put it through that filter of how would I want my story to be told. Right. And, it, and as a result, keep it on a personal level, make them say the things that you want to say, right? Instead of you saying things, you know, create situations where you're asking them questions like, like, what, you know, instead of you saying, what would happen to you if we didn't exist, you would ask them to say, can you explain to the camera or to the audience or in writing or whatever, you know, what does this help provide for you? Allow them to tell your story and you'll be far more impactful than if you just try to tell your story and use them as a puppet to do so, right? So just really be careful and be really respectful. You know, Jim Hainan um, was my original business partner down this journey, and he said, always make sure that you love the people who the story is about more than the outcomes that you're trying to get from them, right? And so that's really important advice, I think, if you go into it with that heart of saying, I'm just here to love that person. I want their story to be known. I want it to be known in a very respectful uh, manner. And I'm going to try to pull this out for them, but, but I'm going to make them say the things that I want to say, right? And it's going to be their words. Mm -hmm. um, probably one more that we can get to before we wrap up today. Um, I think this was when you were talking about that post that you waited a little bit before posting another one because you thought it was good. Um, I think this is Mirna asked, is that a post maybe that they could boost? Yes. Yeah. I didn't want, I, on this particular one, I wanted to, wanted it to go organic. I wanted it to catch wind uh, because I was, I was bragging a little bit. And so if I would then also put some power behind it, you know, with, uh, with money, yeah, I felt like now I'm jamming it down people's throats. I wanted people to, to look at the results and go, wow, that's great. You know, and start talking about it. And rather than me, paying for it to be jammed down everybody's throat right mm -hmm. and so it was just it was the it was that it was that kind of content where it's like man i kind of hoped people would be excited about this and, and want to talk about it uh i gotta be really careful because you know i'm kind of kind of bragging here a little bit and so i decided that's the kind of post i wanted it to be i wanted it to catch organic wind rather than a boost but i agree though like if, if it's if it's a really you're really comfortable with the content and you're just kind of curious why it's not taken off, uh, put some money behind it and see what happens. But I would actually encourage you more to put your money behind posts that are actually working, right? I'm all about peaking the peaks. So if something's not working, I don't want to pour money into it, right? Mm -hmm. If something is working, 
I, I want to see how far I can take it. Right. right. I, I tell, I tell major companies that I work with, it's like, you know, how are you successful? I go, I don't pour money into things that aren't working. I pour money into things that are working and I maximize the potential of that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, we're definitely out of time now. Um, so if there's any questions that we missed, we apologize. But if you would like to reach out to us and ask your question, you can at info at nonprofithub.org. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for today's session. Thank you to our platform partner, Firespring. And huge thank you to our team over at Kilter for being the sponsor of today's webinar. Keep your eye out. You'll get the recording and a full list of resources that will help you build a marketing plan. Um, a member of the Do More Good team will contact the winner of today's webinar for their copy of the Do More Good book. And I think that's all. So please enjoy your day and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Bye.